The Sudanese Army and the nation's paramilitary outfit, the Rapid Support Forces, RSF, who have been at war for the past few weeks, have agreed to extend their truce for 72 hours. A ceasefire had been previously agreed between the warring parties and it was due to expire Thursday midnight. But recent developments can confirm that the Army and the RSF have agreed to an extension. There are details for you in this intro package. Take a listen. The intramilitary conflict in Sudan is taking a new twist. The Sudanese army and the nation's paramilitary outfit, the Rapid Support Forces, ROSF, who have been at war for the past few weeks, have agreed to extend their truce for 72 hours. A ceasefire had been previously agreed between the warring parties and it was due to expire Tuesday midnight. But recent developments can confirm that the army and the RSF have agreed to an extension. Although a truce is in place, the Associated Press has confirmed that both parties never stopped fighting. Nations are now evacuating their nationals from the country. The Egyptian government confirmed on Thursday that at least 16,000 people have crossed into Egypt from Sudan, with 14,000 being Sudanese nationals. More than 500 people have been killed since the war broke out, while over 4,000 are nursing various degrees of wounds. Civilians have been targeted since the war broke out and fighting has hit a crescendo. International organizations have made attempts to wade into the war, but not much has been seen from the warring parties. Sudan's fight for power is tearing the nation apart, and as new developments trickle in, it takes a new shape. So much to talk about, you would agree. Well, I have joined in with me on the program today, Dr. Majudaline El Haj El Taha, democracy and human rights advocate. Of course, joining all the way from Norway. Thank you so much. And You're also, welcome. And also, John Lamevrele, a security expert and author, joining from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for your time, John. My pleasure. All right. Now, let's, uh, of course, get to it. I want to start with you, Doctor. Right? Um, can you just give us an idea of what the current situation is in Sudan and how are civilians being affected by the ongoing conflict, including violence, displacement, and uh, lack of access to uh, basic needs such as food, water, and health care? The situation, thank you so much for um, having me in your program. The um, situation is very, very dire. Um, uh, in Khartoum, the, uh, the unconfirmed statistics of 7 million uh, people in Greater Khartoum altogether. Um, the fighting erupted without prior warning, and um, uh, one uh, party has ground troops, and that is the RSF, uh, clearly dominating, whereas the other uh, party, and that is um, the National Army, they have um, Air Force. Uh, what happened is that uh, this creates uh, this kind of a very dangerous situation whereby the RSF is controlling and roaming around the streets of Khartoum, including residential areas, using um, uh, civilians uh, trapped in the fight as human shields, while an irresponsible, 100% irresponsible um, military uh, targeting the RSF uh, through air bombardment, regardless of the lives of the millions of the people uh, who are trapped in this fight. Uh, the so-called the peace um, corridors or the peace um, deals of uh, ceasefire that uh, they use them more as a military tactical means of regrouping and um, attacking each other by surprise. So what happened in the last um, few days since the war erupted is that they, they would declare a period of, let's say in the beginning it was three hours, and as soon as the people will go out, then they start, uh, both parties, try to uh, like outsmart each other uh, in creating some kind of a victory uh, for their part. So the situation uh, resulted in the statistics that you have referred to at the beginning of your report and that uh, what happened now is that 
people uh, were either uh, being um, uh, bombarded, killed through uh, bombardment and, and, and cross fight and cross fire inside uh, Greater Khartoum, or they are facing an incredibly incredibly uh, difficult situation whereby thousands of people are fleeing through the borders to Egypt. Now, where if you look uh, where uh, Khartoum is situated, it's situated in the middle of the country. Well, the border to Egypt is very, very, very far. Now we're talking of a long stretch of a desert uh, where there is just impossible uh, journey of 12 to 15 hours journey uh, through the road which you are showing now and that is the only road uh, through huge deserts and very many uh, um, very old and sick people incredibly young children including newly borns we have heard of stories of women who gave birth in that kind of uh, of road uh, where there is the temperatures don't forget that sudan is a very very hot country and that part of the sudan is basically part of the um, Sahara Desert with a small uh, stretch of the River Nile uh, meandering through northern Sudan to Egypt. So uh, there is lack of, uh, there are three clusters of uh, human um, uh, civilians uh, fleeing this fight. There is a cluster and that is the largest, that is the one through Egypt, and that is the safest and the closest although it is very far but it still is the closest uh, there is a cluster there humanitarian organizations the united nations and the international community they really need to act and to act now and act very quickly all there right, is right. another we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll get to of course uh, the uh, aspect of where we have to talk about uh, how the international organizations like the un and the likes can come in but uh, quickly doctor i want to leave you just briefly and go to john John, um, I mean, a 72 hour ceasefire uh, that was declared elapsed at midnight. How would you, you know, rate the compliance level, you know, uh, by both parties uh, fighting? Uh, if I get you right, you're asking about ceasefires? Yes, the ceasefire and level of compliance. Up, right? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, you know, first of all, just before I move to answer that particular question, I'd like to just uh, quickly highlight that um, some background, basically, when it comes to the kind of the uh, conflict that we are experiencing in Sudan uh, currently. Um, and of course, Sudan has uh, had a complex and, of course, ongoing history of uh, para para the military and uh, paramilitary conflict with various armed groups operating in different areas in the country. Um, and one of the most significant uh, um, one that we've now seen is the current one, of course, and you know there are also uh, the ongoing conflict in the food, which actually began in, in 2003 with rebel uh, groups, you know, uh, taking up arms against the Sudanese government. But what we are now seeing around this time is a situation where the paramilitary and the military um, are engaging in a serious conflict. And we recently saw uh, some sort of uh, temporary ceasefire, uh, uh, you, know, you know, put in place by both parties. But there have been several attempts, uh, of course, uh, even previously to negotiate ceasefires and peace agreements in, in Sudan. So it's not a new thing between the military, of course, and the paramilitary conflicts over, over the years. And if I may just take you back again in 2019, after months of protests and demonstrations that we saw, the Sudanese government who, uh, was able to overthrow the long time, uh, you know, president, that is President uh, Omar al-Bashir. And what we saw is the transitional government uh, you know, being established. But the transitional government, um, you know, went ahead to make uh, various efforts to negotiate a ceasefire with the armed opposition groups, particularly the Darfur region. And in October 2020, if I recall, if my memory serves me well, the government, uh, you know, signed off uh, some sort of an agreement with the, uh, several armed groups, including the Sudanese uh, Liberation 
uh, army, uh, the mini, what we call the mini Minawi faction, uh, the Justice and Equality Movement and the Sudan People Liberation Movement in the North. That ceasefire did not work as it was expected, and it has led to a culmination of what, what we are now experiencing, uh, the conflict between the para paramilitary group and now the military. So, uh, you know, while, uh, of course, that particular peace agreement that we saw was seen as a positive step uh, to us ending the conflict, these were now, as you know, exposed the underbellies of uh, the effort that have always been put around the ceasefire. So it's unfortunate uh, that to, uh, even uh, amid, uh, you know, the agreements that were made around the temporary ceasefires uh, that we were expecting, we've seen even uh, like today, uh, you know, the paramilitary team engaging in further conflict to the extent of even attacking, uh, like uh, we saw in the news, them attacking the Turkish, uh, you know, uh, team that was trying to evacuate, the clans that were trying to evacuate the Turkish team out of the country. So that then uh, basically exposes uh, the lack of commitment in both, uh, and particularly on the, the party of the, the paramilitary team, uh, if uh, the allegations by the military is anything to go by, that this particular ceasefire uh, uh, is not as comprehensive uh, as we will have, uh, you know, expected. All right. Uh, I, I still want to, uh, I mean, backtrack a bit, uh, taking you on. But this time around, I'd like to direct the question to Dr. Uh, Madeline. Now, um, let's go back a bit to how all of this started. I mean, the warring factions, the warring generals used to be allies. I mean, they came together to oust a 30-year uh, administration, uh, which, of course, was greeted with some level of acceptance by the people. But right now, um, they are at loggerheads. They are fighting, and civilians are suffering. Um, how would you look at um, what exactly is going on right now in Sudan uh, in terms of the reception of the people of Sudan? Um, is it, is it, w w can they say it's a price you pay for, for uh, will I call it democracy or, 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 or national development? Or uh, is it a fight that in itself is not necessary? Um, the, the, none of the two parties which are fi fighting now, uh, I would not be surprised if there is going to be a third element, uh, a fragmentation of that, so that there is going to be uh, three possibly uh, um, uh, parties which are fighting, none of them represent the interests of the people. None of them has any form of credibility. Uh, if we take just the two uh, fighting parties uh, now, uh, like you said, they were um, they were in partnership in 2019, but indeed um, there is part, their partnership goes a long way back from their times in Darfur, where they collaborated with General Burhan, uh, coming from the, uh, the standard um, official military of the Sudan, and Himeti just being a, um, a nomad trader uh, who was clever enough to, uh, uh, to build around himself a number of militia at the behest of uh, Burhan and the Sudanese government uh, at the time. Uh, then um, what it is is that they are fighting, they, the, both of them, they have huge records of human rights violations and believe it, will voracious kind of crimes uh, on their hands. They came into partnership uh, because it suited them at the time uh, to be able to, um, to, to, to come into an alliance in order to preserve, uh, it's a kind of um, uh, survival mechanism uh, against the mass uh, civilian uh, movement of uh, pro-democracy uh, uh, fighters and, and, and civilian uh, fighters for civil uh, civil ruling in the Sudan. So it suited them at the time to come into an alliance 
in order, uh, but they were never really serious at all about a transition to democracy or uh, accountability or persecution or anything uh, for the war crimes or for those who are killed in the demonstration. They're not serious about that. What they were serious about is that under the pressure of the civil demonstrations and civil strikes, uh, that have engulfed the country in, during that time, that they unite, duck down, and try to um, try to come to a settlement with the civilians at the time. That went until the, uh, the time when they were supposed to hand over the power to the civilians. Then they uh, collaborated to make the coup d'état. Of mm. course, for two men who are very uh, power safety and block safety, uh, they made the coup d'état. Uh, but then, both of uh, each one of them wanted to be to have the sole power for themselves, and that's what we are facing now. Mm. So, from nine, uh, 2019, it, all the movements they have been doing are tactical, and and they do not differ from each other in terms of ends, uh, uh, means, what they want in the end, in terms of history, in terms of tactics, in terms of. Uh, of um, lack of credibility, they, they're just equally as bad. Uh, they do not represent the interest, neither the economic or the security or uh, the sovereignty interests of the country. All right, uh, I want to go back to you, John. Now, how has the lack of reliable electricity and communication uh, affected the ability of aid organizations to provide assistance in Sudan? And also, what measures can be taken to overcome these challenges? So, uh, in my opinion, I actually think uh, the lack of those particular resources, um, um, and as much as we are saying as fuel some sort of um, you know, conflict in terms of really people uh, competing for scarce uh, resources, such as, uh, you know, uh, lack of, of power, as well as other, you know, meaningful, uh, you know, resources like water, uh, grazing land, and, and uh, particularly in areas prone to drought and desertification. The government, uh, of course, had earlier tried to take uh, a number of steps to address a number of issues. And, of course, uh, you know, uh, the many challenges cannot, uh, I mean, the many challenges that are faced by the Sudanese people uh, are not largely just based on, on, on the resources that we're talking about, but there are also factors like intercommunal violence that uh, have, uh, you know, sort of precipitated, uh, you know, this particular violence. But uh, in my take, I think uh, what the government can do uh, to address these particular issues um, is, is basic, you know, it's just about directing, uh, you know, resources uh, uh, appropriately to be able to address the issue. But uh, in my, you know, honest opinion, I do not actually think these are the issues that are really causing this particular uh, conflict, because if you look at um, uh, the real cause, it's basically about power. The two forces that are now fighting, which is the military, and, and of course, the paramilitary are uh, individuals, groups, and individuals that are basically looking after themselves as individuals. So it's for me more of fight for power, my, uh, more of fight for recognition, more of fight, you know, uh, you know, uh, to be seen, uh, to you know, call more muscles than the other. So it's more of a power play fight than really. Uh, the issues uh, that uh, we are looking at in terms of resources. Those are just excuses that most of the time are used by these particular leaders to sort of, uh, you know, get the control. But if you were to look at it uh, from a moral, uh, you know, perspective for what needs to be done, I think it's for the leaders to be accountable in terms of really playing their part to ensure that uh, the taxes are directed to where they're supposed to be directed in terms of really uh, creating development uh, in the country. Because when you look at Sudan, uh, there are a lot of disparities and marginalization. There, is, there are issues of inter, you know intercommunal conflicts that needs to be to be dealt. 
whereas, uh, you know, parties, individuals, either, uh, I mean, communities that, uh, you know, associate themselves to be Arabs and the others as non-Arabs, you know, feeling that they are not having equal share of the resources. So uh, that said, I think the main problem is uh, power play over uh, really the, the, the resource issues that we are talking about. All right. I, I want to stay with you, John, right? Um, you, of course, made reference, uh, you gave an illustration of uh, a report that, of course, was earlier said concerning a particular country that was trying to evacuate its citizens and uh, their plane got attacked. We've seen efforts by countries trying to, you know, pull out some of their nationals, you know, in the country. We've seen efforts by Nigeria, the U.S. and the likes. Now, what kind of violence have uh, evacuees witnessed uh, while fleeing the, con the conflict in Sudan? And uh, what is being done to ensure their safety, particularly locally? So when you look at uh, what is happening in the country, I think uh, there is a lot of tension and uh, a lot of, you know, risks that uh, individuals, particularly who are, you know, foreigners in those countries, because they could suffer collateral damage. Uh, from what is happening, that we are already seeing a, a significant impact, you know, from this particular uh, situation, um, where one and one of the major impacts that we are seeing of this particular uh, conflict has been, before I even address that, has been, you know, things like displacement of hundreds uh, and of, of thousands of people, uh, both uh, the, in, in the capital of Sudan and in other parts of the country. And of course, it has created a humanitarian, a humanitarian crisis for many people, lacking access to necessities such as food, water, and health care. Remember, this was sort of sporadic. So there could be, you know, individuals and uh, you know foreigners in the country who could have, you know, found themselves unprepared for what, what really happened, and uh, they could be suffering from lack of even basic necessities. The, the practice usually when such um, conflict occurs is that um, it's usually advisable for people first to shelter in place. Sheltering uh, ring in place basically means uh, you know, remaining you know, within uh, safe havens or those particular locations that you will consider as safe because any sort of movement out of those safe localities will predispose you to danger. So my advice for those who will be uh, held in the country uh, who, uh, right now and uh, they are not able to move from point one to the other is for them to shelter in place. Um, and of course, uh, uh, if they are preempted this particular situation, they will have uh, you know, basic necessities like food and water, is for them to you know, utilize that uh, and of course, uh, raise um, uh, their alerts or, or, or distress calls so that then their particular embassies are able to really know where they are uh, located uh, so that then when there is a window and particularly around this time when we're talking about ceasefire even though we are not seeing it to be really a comprehensive and a, and, and a reliable one right. uh, when you have that particular window and of course through um, you know, the management or, uh, you know, particular uh, country, uh, you know, interventions, then they'll be able to do, to, to really take the necessary actions to be able to leave the country. So the first point is for you to shelter in place wherever you are, okay. even as you wait uh, for your respective uh, embassies uh, or governments uh, to come, uh, you know, and to your citizens. But uh, I, I don't know whether uh, there was also uh, a question around uh, what the international community needs to really do now around this time. Of because course, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. About, we'll get to that. But uh, uh, I, I just want to bring in uh, the doctor on this one uh, before we go on a uh, break. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, doctor, in addition to the, of course, uh, evacuation efforts, let's look at the death toll and uh, humanitarian crisis that is currently going on as a result of this uh, conflict. I mean, what are the greatest challenges facing aid organizations 
in that particular region as we speak. I mean, we've seen numbers of people that have been killed and also those that have been injured. And uh, it's so sad that right now the healthcare, particularly in Khartoum, is uh, almost you know, at ground level. So uh, what challenges and what do you think can be done to at least, uh, will I say, manage the humanitarian crisis there? Uh, like I said, um, the fighting in Khartoum is very, very dangerous. I understand very well that in Greater Khartoum it's very difficult for aid organizations to have access. Uh, luckily, Sudan is a huge country whereby uh, the three main clusters to the borders to Egypt, the border to Ethiopia, and through the Red Sea, uh, the, the Port Sudan, these are all completely 100% safe areas, no fight areas. There are uh, several uh, thousands of people who are stranded there. What we have been talking to, uh, like for example, Norwegian organizations and Norwegian foreign ministry and so on, we as uh, Sudanese in diaspora trying to, um, to, 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 to try and get uh, the international community to act and act fast is to that uh, first of all, through the Red Sea, very many uh, ships uh, can be mobilized uh, very quickly uh, to arrive in Port Sudan. Like I said, it's completely 100% safe, and this is a cluster area through through the Red Sea. The other area through Egypt, I mean, the whole of Egypt is a very safe area. The, there are thousands of people stranded at the borders of Egypt, so it's very quick and very fast that um, the international community and other organizations can come uh, to the borders of northern Sudan uh, via Egypt and Upper, uh, upper Nile uh, areas from Egypt. Uh, that, that, and then the third uh, cluster is through Ethiopia. That, I might say, maybe uh, it can be a little bit uh, problematic because of uh, the war, uh, the other border, which is, uh, there is a ceasefire now in Ethiopia, but um, not very long ago there was a, the Tigray uh, war, which uh, affected the eastern part of the country. Uh, however, these two passes uh, through Egypt and through the Red Sea, this is completely 100% safe. The international community should and should have acted already very fast. Uh, we see a lack and reluctance uh, in the international community and the speed. And very sadly, I would have shared it with you, uh, there is a, um, a kind of uh, a, a, a cartoon uh, drawing uh, passing around among Sudanese social media, whereby you, there is uh, two um, booths, one with Ukraine and one with the Sudan, and there is a, a figure uh, desk-like support. And then you see a line, a long, long line with different flags, uh, the United States and, and Britain and Canada and Japan and all of them. Uh, helping the Ukraine all the time. They're not required to have visas. The borders are open. Huge uh, mobilization for humanitarian and fast as well uh, to help the Ukrainian refugees. And there is none for the Sudan. And that, um, that uh, cartoon is very, very telling of the current situation in the Sudan. And we kind of, uh, some activists put that as uh, their um, profile picture in their Facebook and WhatsApp groups and so on, and Twitter, in order to draw the world's attention and conscience into the conflict in Sudan, uh, to see that disparity between how much attention a Ukrainian refugee gets and how little or no attention a Sudanese refugee gets, it's quite scandalous. All right. All right, uh, thank you so much. Well, uh, at this point, we need to go on a quick break. Of course, when we return, we'll be talking about uh, something really pivotal, and that is the impact of this conflict on neighboring countries, and if at all, there are foreign interest in any way in this particular crisis amongst many topical issues within this particular conflict. Stick around with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. If you're just joining in, this is Secure the Continent, and we have been discussing the security situation in Sudan and the ceasefire agreement. We still have on the show Dr. Majudlin El Haj El Taha, a democracy and human rights advocate, joining us from Norway, and also John Lemerele, a security expert and author, joining from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for your time, amazing people. 
All right, so let's, uh, yeah, let's get straight to it. Now, uh, let's look at, um, of course, uh, the uh, impact of this conflict, this uh, crisis across the Sudanese border, particularly uh, on countries that, you know, uh, border uh, with Sudan, for instance, Egypt. How would you say, uh, or would you say to a very large extent or to any extent at all, this conflict has had any form of impact on the neighboring countries? It's a question for me? Yes, for you, Doctor. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Um, well, um, very clearly, there are already, uh, since the uh, troubles of the Sudan in the last um, 20 years, I would say, and uh, even before that, uh, there has been a huge uh, influx of refugees uh, into Egypt, both from South Sudan and from North Sudan. And uh, with the current crisis, uh, your uh, statistics say that uh, 16,000 um, refugees at the borders of Egypt, I would believe that is a lot more than that. And the ones are in the move are who have not arrived at the borders yet, there are even more. Uh, some people are, um, uh, there are a lot of people going to Egypt. So this does affect Egypt and puts a huge uh, pressure uh, on Egypt. And you have to remember, um, Egypt, geographically speaking, <clears throat> is not a very, big country like the Sudan and also the habitable areas in Egypt are even uh, less than it is in the Sudan. So in terms of um, sheer number of people, um, Egypt is a very, very populous country. I believe it's 102 million uh, people added to that all the refugees, Sudanese refugees who are, uh, are already there, plus the ones who are on their way there. I think this creates a very difficult situation. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, political consequences. Um, Egypt has always uh, played a very negative uh, role in the Sudan, that being historical or uh, in more uh, contemporary uh, prospect, Egypt has um, systematically uh, intervened uh, to um, stop democracy and democratic movements in the Sudan what and uh, call that, for doctor. civil doctor, you, uh, said, in the you Sudan. Said, you said Egypt has played mostly a negative role in Sudan and has tried yes. stopping democracy. Yes. Would you like to like really expand more on that? But I can't do that. Uh, if we take, uh, for example, despite uh, the coup d'etat of the Islamists in 1989, led by al Bashir, which lasted for 30 years, they have very clear uh, differences with the Egyptian military, uh, precisely ideologically, uh, because the, the military ruling in the Sudan was ideologically an Islamic Muslim Brotherhood based kind of uh, ruling, whereas in Egypt it was military rule, uh, a more liberal kind of rule, and a more Western allied kind of ruling under Hosni Mubarak, and now under Sisi. Uh, whereas in the Sudan it was more, a, Bashir was an, is more aligned to the Muslim Brotherhood and more radical Islam uh, affiliations. This made them uh, differ ideologically. However, the concept itself that uh, the Sudan is ruled by a military regime is very uh, convenient for, for Egypt. Because these two countries, you must uh, realize that historically, and I'm talking not just like um, two, three hundred years, we go back together a long, long way. We go back uh, thousands of years. Our uh, culture and civilization, whether we like it or we don't like it, are very much intermingled. There are pyramids in the Sudan, there are pyramids in Egypt, and there is, um, there is a whole Nubian civilization. That is just across the, what, what kind, if you go to the museum in Oswan, which is uh, uh, South Egypt, it's basically the history of the Sudan mm. in that museum. Oh. How, and, and, and as such, and as such, and as such, it is very, uh, we are affected by each other. The Muslim Brotherhood movement of the Sudan was a extension to the Muslim Brotherhood movement in Egypt mm. and its birth in the 1940s. Uh, if, and the Sudanese people have successfully toppled many uh, military regimes and in, uh, with uh, 
aspiration of establishing democracy. And we did have uh, a few uh, years of democratic ruling in the 60s, 80s, and even now in 2019, uh, which were always uh, ended up with a coup d'etat. Each and every time, Egyptian intelligence has its hands and uh, tactic with um, with the military of the Sudan for those coup d'etat, including the last one of the 25th of uh, I mean, of October 2021. However, however, okay. Egypt does not want really a, a instability in the Sudan. They want a Sudan which is stable enough under the rule of military leaders who have their loyalty and orders from the Egyptian military as a big brother for the Egyptian economic and financial interests to continue in the country. So in a way, they do want the military, but they don't want the war. Mm. All right. I, I want to go to John right now. I mean, these are pretty weighty allegations, John. Uh, do you also share in the, well, I say school of thought that uh, Egypt has had a bit of negative influence on Sudan? And also, uh, let's also talk about uh, uh, Libya's eastern warlord, Khalifa Haftar. Uh, would you say he also had a role uh, to play in this particular conflict that, of course, has uh, seen two uh, military generals, you know, go toe to toe in a conflict? So I think in my opinion, um, what we are seeing currently um, is a conflict uh, between the military and the paramilitary, but uh, and such kind of uh, conflicts which are caused by military or, you know, individuals that are sort of expected to, you know, protect the, the you know, the country, um, range, of course, uh, can have a range of causes, in as much as we are saying that there could be, uh, you know, um, there could be other, other factors that influence that. And, of course, uh, the causes could range from, you know, territorial disputes, uh, as we earlier looked at also resource conflicts, we had also looked at political rivalry, uh, ideological differences, and I think my fellow panelists has tried to, you know, expose some of those uh, things when you are looking at it from, you know, ideological differences. Uh, when you, you I mean, she was talking about the you know, Muslim, you know, brotherhood and the, you know, affiliation of the former president to, to, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood will, of course, uh, try to advance particular causes. And in uh, the, doing so, therefore, you know, uh, sort of create this conflict through their sources by trying to influence either the military or the paramilitary or other sources to cause this particular conflict. Um, but uh, just before uh, I, I give my opinion on that, I think what I wanted to add uh, uh, over and above what she said in terms of the, the impacts of this particular conflict that we are seeing in Sudan, it has uh, had you know, significant impact on not only other factors, let's even look at it from security and particularly for, on the regional security, and particularly in the neighboring countries like, you know, South Sudan, uh, Chad, we are talking about uh, Egypt now, and of course, Libya. And the conflict uh, is likely to, you know, uh, excavate things like, you know, glorification of weapons, the rise of armed groups in the region. And now that we're also talking about, you know, um, the differences between various uh, communities in particular countries, then you are likely to see this, this happening. Uh, we are also likely to start seeing increased risk in terms of cross-border attacks, as well as potential for spillover violence into neighboring countries uh, that are actually borrowing this country. And of course, it is also likely, if it has not already begun having an impact, uh, on, you know, the economy, particularly on the cross-border threat, and of course, movement of goods and people in those particular areas, and the instability and se in the insecurity that this also caused uh, by this particular conflict, uh, are likely to disrupt the regional economies and, you know, trade routes 
and of course contributing to other socio-economic issues like poverty and economic hardship. All right. Area. And the conflict has uh, and has and I believe if it's not addressed quickly, will have broader, you know, geopolitical um, impacts with regional and inter international actors becoming involved in efforts to resolve the crisis. And of course, this will create a lot of tension and rivalries actually even between different countries and factions, but potentially uh, you know, escalating the conflict and its impact on the regional security. And why am I saying that? Because there are talks that uh, have not been verified uh, that there are other countries or other, you know, forces that are also playing a part in really causing this particular impact. All right. Uh, from my assessment, yeah, from my personal assessment, I think uh, overall uh, this particular conflict that we are seeing between the uh, military and the parliamentary in Sudan uh, is largely political, in my view, where people are fighting for power. And whenever, uh, wherever we've seen people fighting for power, there usually are other interests that could be without the country. I mean, uh, you know, uh, coming from other sources, uh, could it be from the neighboring countries, could it be from other, uh, you know, uh, organizations. Okay. Uh, but what I can say is that this particular conflict in Sudan will, uh, without uh, any doubt, have mm. far-reaching impacts on mm. the regional security, and it will definitely escalate even the existing tensions that we are seeing, uh, you know, in the region, and will likely contribute to instability and insecurity in the region. Okay, John. So, I, 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 I might need to just cut yeah. in here, so John, that's my because. Opinion, that, me. Okay, I might, I might just need to cut in, John, but I'll get back to you shortly. I want to go back to uh, Dr. Madeline. Now, let's look at the interest of some uh, key international players. We are talking of the likes of Russia, the likes of China, the likes of the U.S. We've seen in recent times. Uh, will I call it more like their scramble for Africa? We've seen uh, the U.S. Vice President pay a visit to Africa. We've seen the influence of China too, you know, to a very large extent in Africa and also Russia. Now, uh, uh, in your own opinion, uh, do you think that uh, these uh, various international actors, such as Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, uh, actually have any form of vested interest uh, in the crisis in Sudan? Uh, there is a crisis in Sudan because of the vested interests of the uh, foreign uh, powers, which you just mentioned now, and in addition uh, that they found uh, internally uh, players who have also interests. Uh, the Sudan under uh, Bashir has been uh, open for sale for anyone uh, who will pay um, uh, the highest bid. And by that I mean anything and everything from uh, from uh, resources like gold and 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 and, 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 um, and so on to geo uh, geo geopolitical positions like uh, having there is a huge um, interest in the Red Sea and uh, Russians for example they want to build a military base in the Red Sea the Turks they want to build a military base in the Red Sea uh, the Americans and Israelis they want to build a military base in the Red Sea uh, uh, off the coast of Sudan so the Red Sea area is very very important for uh, huge players and um, the Wagner Group, they operate along the whole Sahel, including Sudan. All the countries in the Sahel uh, is, are, um, are Wagner uh, mercenaries who are, um, who are operating there for, uh, for the different resources of the Sudan. The Sudan as well also, uh, the young men of the Sudan are sold, and I mean by the head. I'm, 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 I, I, these are quite verified, and I have an authority saying that in order to fight the war uh, in uh, Yemen uh, on behalf of the Saudis and the Emiratis. The Saudis and the Emiratis in their war in Yemen, they use Saudi and Emirati soldiers for, um, for airstrikes. Uh, 
and the use of the Sudanese soldiers as ground troops. These Sudanese soldiers, uh, namely Burhan and Hemeti, they uh, sell them by the head, like you want 100 heads, and then they receive the money. Of that, maybe perhaps 10% goes to the fighter and his family, and 90% uh, goes uh, to um, enrich the empire of uh, these two men and uh, empires they Okay, have. doctor, b b because we have to go, I just want your quick take on this. I mean, if possible, I mean, in a sentence, do you see a peaceful resolution to this conflict in Sudan anytime soon? Yes, if there is an international political will, there will be a conf uh, there will be. Uh, literally speaking, these uh, guys are not strong at all. And an evidence to that that there is no winner as yet, and there is not going to be. Okay, so militarily wise, they are not, uh, they, are, they, they are weak. The soldiers are very uh, broken in the ground, both moral and even feeding, and they're very poor, and they're very poorly paid, and poorly trained. That's when it comes military. When it comes to, um, to politically, they don't have any popular or base support. Therefore, they are already weak, like I said, militarily and politically. What is missing is uh, political will of the international community to put enough pressure on them. And you'd put pressure on them by taking away their economic power for them. In one evening, the United States right. can freeze all the assets of these two generals. Do they do that? No, they don't. All right. Uh, just quickly before I also uh, let you go, let's ask uh, John. John, what's your take? Do you see a peaceful resolution anytime soon? Briefly. Um. Obviously, uh, there the, is likelihood and possibility of this, uh, you know, uh, situation being de-escalated and resolved, but it will require a lot of effort and particularly the intervention of both the international community as well as the African Union in trying to really support uh, initiatives or even come up with initiatives uh, to address this particular situation. And the way that that can be easily done is if the international community uh, can uh, initiate a quick uh, support um, in terms of peace uh, negotiation between the two, you know, factions, that's the military and the paramilitary, uh, the international community can really play a key role in facilitating those negotiations. Uh, these uh, will basically include the provision of you know, technical assistance, mediation support, and resources to help you know, build trust and foster dialogue between the parties. Because deep down, I'll tell you, these parties will want to be brought together on a table. All right. Uh, and what we, what we are basically seeing is possibility of them really you know, uh, uh, as, uh, you know, relying mostly on, on their pride. So there's need for the All international right. community to quickly come into, into play to try and initiate those particular negotiations to help address that. All but right, thank you so much, John. I'm sorry, but we are really... The international community should work with the, uh, the both stakeholders to okay. address... All right, John, thank you so much for your time. I'm really sorry, but we are pressed with time. Thank you uh, so much for being a part of this uh, show. Dr. Majulin El-Hajj El-Taha, Democracy and Human Rights Advocate, uh, all the way from Norway, and also John Lemerele, a security expert and author, joining from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you once again uh, for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for it. All right. Now, the conflict between Sudanese General Bahan and Amerti of the Rapid Support Forces Paramilitary requires a multifaceted approach to resolve, including dialogue and negotiations, power sharing agreements, international pressure, and potentially a military intervention as a last resort. To make Sudan a democratic state, it is essential to address the underlying political and economic issues that fuel the conflict. A sustainable solution will require a long term commitment from all the stakeholders, including the Sudanese government, regional powers, and the international community. On that note, I say thank you so much for your time. Remember to stay safe, because security is your priority. My name is Dakwa Adeboye. Bye for now.